Excellent. Well, we might as well uh, get started. Morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the first for 2022 seminar of the legendary JKMRC um, Friday morning seminar series. And uh, hi, Matt, on the line. It's great to see that people are piling in already online. Um, all right, my name is Katarina, and myself and Kalina Barbosa will be taking turns introducing uh, the speakers this year. So on behalf of the University of Queensland and the Sustainable Minerals Institute, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners, the Yigera and the Turbo peoples, and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize and value the contributions to Australian and global society. Our speaker today, Professor Rick Valenta, probably does not need introductions, but in case you are not familiar with him, uh, here are a few career highlights. Uh, so since January of this year, he is the SMI's Deputy Director of Production, which is a key operational and strategic leadership role with responsibility for BRC, JKMRC, and NISH. He also leads research aimed at improving the discovery, mining, and processing of hydrothermal ore deposits. Uh, Rick also has a strong focus on developing of 14 mineral systems models from deposit to regional scales using these models to improve targeting techniques, better formulate geological and resource models, and inform prediction of mineral processing performance. Trained as a geologist, Rick worked for a short time in petroleum exploration for some reason in Western Canada before continuing uh, before coming to Australia to complete a PhD on the George Fisher zinc-led uh, silver deposit in the Mount Isaac region. He then spent five years as a lecturer at Monash University in an industry-supported role aimed at developing the science and practice of structural interpretation of geophysical data. Um, is this the origin of Monash Mafia? <laughs> Good. Rick then spent over two decades in industry roles, including chief geologist, um, chief operating officer, and multiple CEO roles around the world, and um, companies and exploration teams under the direction under his direction have been involved in a significant number of mineral discoveries of copper, uranium, and gold. And he has been with SMI for the last five years or so. So today, Rick will be presenting on Queensland's critical minerals potential, the new economy mineral compilation, research aimed at discovery and extraction of critical minerals in Queensland, and mineral system-based prospectivity analysis for a range of new economy minerals. All right. Thanks, Katarina. Oh. That was a long introduction. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to start today by actually talking a little bit in, more in general about the critical minerals research that um, that we're involved in um, at the SMI and with our with our partners. And I'll refer to some research that we're, that we're not involved in in a general way as well. Um, and then move in to talk about the new economy mineral compilation, um, which is something I've, I've been involved in working on along with Paul Gow, Katarina, Karen, and, and others really. Um, so I guess what I wanted to start with, say, you know, why, why are we hearing about critical minerals all the time? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think a lot of people are getting to the boredom threshold on hearing about why we're worrying about critical minerals. But there's some, some really obvious global trends that are driving this. One is decarbonization, new and different commodity requirements um, that are really being put in place to meet some of the climate change threats that we're experiencing. Um, and that's leading to an increased mineral demand, you know, due to population growth, decarbonization, and other factors. Um, and and um, th that, of course, requires us to find new deposits and also exploit deposits that we don't know how to exploit right now. Um, and of course, we're all aware acutely right now of the geopolitical factors that are affecting world mineral supply and networks. Um, and, and those geopolitical factors are becoming more and more serious. Um, through complex ore bodies, you would have heard me say quite a few times probably that you know one of the other big challenges 
um, and it extends to critical minerals is the fact that a lot of the mineral supply is locked up in complex and multifaceted challenges and there are increased thresholds um, from the point of view of societal permission uh, but also investor activism and environmental standards that uh, that make it more and more difficult to, to put more bodies into production but on the on the critical mineral um, side of things the other factor that's happening that's not a global one but it's a national one um, and and it, it's something that does extend to quite a few other countries is this sudden recognition that we really need to get ourselves up to speed on critical minerals and in australia there's a critical minerals facilitation office whose vision is for australia to become the world leader in uh, in critical minerals for an exploration extraction production processing point of view and their goals are to attract investment into the sector to spur innovation into set into the sector and and, and uh and invest in infrastructure that will allow us to meet those goals. Just another little preliminary. Um, this is the, the latest Geoscience Australia um, periodic table of the, of, uh, of the elements with the, um, with the red boxes being the ones they consider to be critical. So, so of course, we've got the, the rare earths across the bottom here. Um, and a few other significant ones, uh, lithium we would have all heard about, vanadium, very topical in, in, um, in Queensland, as, as are um, um, gallium, indium, um, and, and uh, tungsten. So, I mean, the, 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 um, every country um, ha has a slightly different critical minerals list because it's what's critical to them, how much their domestic supply is, what their requirements are, and so on, but this is Australia's one. So what are our key focus areas? Because you can't do everything. Um, so the key focus areas for our research are the ones I've listed here. Finding, find the critical minerals to meet future requirements, to develop new and sustainable mining and processing approaches, um, to explore alternative supply sources. This one like on, might have to explain that's a, that's a bacterium in the plant. There's a tailing stand to develop products that meet the needs of downstream industry um, and, uh, and, and develop innovation to, to foster that industry. And, and another one that, that a lot of people overlook is to understand and address potential unintended consequences of this, of this enormous rush to decarbonization that we're being forced into, uh, into carrying out. And what I've listed across the bottom here are, are some of the groups that are supporting our research. And the biggest icon of all there is the Geological Survey of Queensland Department of Resources, because they're really the biggest supporter of a lot of the research we're doing. But we're also doing work with Geoscience Australia. Um, there are now, as of this year, we have two ARC uh, grants to people who are involved in this research, one DECRA and one Discovery Grant, um, as well as some uh, companies we're working with. A, uh, a 3D modeling company, a Euclidean chronomet, um, with and support from Metz United. And what's our vision, or what's the what's UQ's vision, or, or and this is not official UQ vision. This is my proposed vision for UQ. Where do we want to be? What do we want to say about ourselves in 2032? And I'd really like to see us set up as a world leader in critical minerals innovation to have played a key role in meeting all of these challenges, identifying and meeting them. Um, to produce a generation of in industry leaders who, who are equipped to, uh, you know, accomplish the change that we're going to need to accomplish in the next little while, to, and to maximize the value from all the groups that we have that could, we could potentially bring to bear on these problems, um, and, and have UQ as a recognized leader in industry-sponsored research in this area, and of course to lead um, lead commercialization arising from the research we carry out. So I'm just going to go through, uh, you know, a couple of examples, starting with the uh, starting with the, the finding part. So we have uh, uh, three three different projects I've highlighted here: the Queensland New Economy Minerals uh, Compilation. That's being led by Paul Gow, though. Though I, I spent a fair bit of my time outside of hours last year um, working on it as well. Um, the Northeast Queensland Mineral Deposit Atlas, and we actually had a, 
uh, a, a two hour webinar with what, how many 12, 11 or 12 presenters yesterday in, in conjunction with the, with the GSQ um, relating to Northeast Queensland. And from what I understand, it went very well. And, and we have also have a project on massive um, or visualization of massive 3D geoscientific data sets. And that's being led by Steve Nicholthwaite. And then if we look at the development of new and sustainable mining and processing approaches, we have a big rare earth project and it's a very distinctive and exciting one because we're not just saying, okay, how are we going to develop better hydromet approaches for rare earths? We're looking at hydromet, phyto mining, bio extraction, and working with a really cross-disciplinary group and finding in some cases like Mary Kathleen, for example, that some of the solutions might be hybrids of all those three rather than just applying one or the other or the other. Uh, Nathan Fox is involved in and, and actually has a, a, a new project with, uh, with, with Chronomet um, and working on, working on uh, sorting and other technologies for pre-concentration of, of tungsten in uh, Mount Carbide. And, uh, and there are also other hydrometallurgy projects being led by James Vaughan in, uh, in chemical engineering. And other areas of research that we're working on that have a, a strong bearing on this are high voltage pulse preconcentration that a lot of you would have heard of before. Um, we're trying to develop a suite of, of tests, and this is being led by Mosin, and Marson is also heavily involved, looking at trying to, trying to develop a suite of tests that will allow a company to gauge the effectiveness of some of the new approaches that that have uh, lower emissions, um, um, lower energy usage, and produce less waste. Um, that will that, that companies can apply for a new project, or if they want to change their uh, their processing approach. And of course, many is doing work on on mining carbon footprints in, in mining operations. And then on alternative supply sources, we're doing a lot of work on on tailings. That's being led by Anita. She's not here because she's out sampling tailings. Um, working on Queensland's mine waste, and that's been going on for a couple of years. We've just started a project with Geoscience Australia, um, leading the mine waste and sampling module for the Exploring for the Future program, um, which is a, a, a new program that started last year with Geoscience Australia. And, and some case studies as well, I'm showing just highlighting one from Anita Araga Fox there, and one from Mansur Draki. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one, but there is a significant amount of research looking at various stages of downstream processing led by um, led by researchers from chemical engineering and elsewhere. And again, I've already mentioned James Vaughn, but also the Power Metallurgy Innovation Center, um, um, Eugene Jack and Peter Hayes, um, that are doing uh, that are doing a lot of good good work in, in that area. And then. The other one I wanted to mention, which I think is very important, is uh, a group of research projects, both of which are ARC supported, that are actually sitting down and thinking about the implications of the transition that we're going through from the point of view of biodiversity. And that's being led by Laura Saunter from uh, Earth Sciences. And, uh, and then the social and environmental complexities of extracting energy transition metals, which is again around mapping source risks and trying to understand well, what's going to happen if we achieve this mineral supply in terms of the social and environmental biodiversity complexities and that's being led by Eleanor Lev, uh, who, um, who has a, a DECRA. So that's a, a bit of a look at some of the critical minerals related research that we're, we're carrying out currently and, and it's really I guess trying to fit within this uh, within this vision that I'll come back to at the end of the at the end of the talk. But what I want to do now is talk about this little, you know, you are here, find the critical minerals to meet future requirements. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that now. And one of the projects that we did for that was one that we call the, the New Economy Minerals Compilation. And essentially the rationale is, if you were looking for, if you went to Northwest Queensland, you were looking for copper or, or lead zinc, you would have an enormous amount of pre-competitive data sets available to you. Um, you would be able to, to go and download, for example, uh, a study from, from 2011 that had a whole range of different data sets that included 
a series of targets. So this map here, um, all these different colored polygons are targets for different styles of mineralization that have been built up on the basis of a set of geological criteria or even prospectivity models, in this case, weights of evidence models that again, take, take a series of different characteristics and map prospectivity on the basis of their spatial interaction. Um, and yeah, so it's compilations of all the, all the data, as well as you know areas of interest that are defined on those criteria. But there's nothing like that for, for a lot of the new economy minerals, for rare earths, for, for tin, for tungsten, for, for um, you know, the, the whole molybdenum, rhenium, um, the various different new economy minerals that uh, are of increasing interest, cobalt, um, it's another example. So, so that was really the aim of this project. But what I want, I'm going to take another little diversion here and, and talk about um, targeting. I spent probably 10 years or so, 15 years of my life doing, doing targeting. And in geology, targeting means um, early on, it was very much, you're saying, why are you showing me a photo of a kitten on your screen? Um, it's build it and they will come. So you take all these different data sets and, and say, well, okay, if, if I've got a fault going through here and I've got the right host rock that's the right age with the right characteristics, and it's got a, uh, and, and there's a signature in the satellite data that, that gives me encouragement that there's something there, then I'm gonna define that as a target. And uh, that's really the build it and they will come uh, philosophy that you pick all these geological ingredients, work out where they spatially coincide um, in terms of their characteristics, and, and you target that. That works really well until, and if you did that in Mount Isa region, you would have never targeted Century because Century is the wrong age. And it doesn't have a pyritic halo. It's got a bunch of other characteristics that are different. So if you just take a recipe from what you know, apply that recipe to the data sets, you're gonna miss things. Um, so the build it and they will come sort of works, but it doesn't always work. And of course the other one, is ready or not, here they here I come, which is basically, and this also, I'm going to apply this to the Mount Isa region as well. So this map on the right here, um, we're looking at probably 300 kilometers from south to north. So it's a big area, it covers the whole outcropping area of the Mount Isa region. And that heat map is density of copper occurrences. And actually it was Yohan Sanislav from from JCU that I first heard point this out most <clears throat> clearly. He said, how can we be going for specific geological ingredients when you can see that concentration of copper deposits marching across five or six different, completely different geological terrains. They're different age, they're different characteristics, they're different everything. And yet there it is, that knot of, of, uh, of deposits. And so what that tells you is um, there's an element there of ready or not, here I come. It's a process. So there's a high temperature copper bearing saline fluid at a certain age um, in this area. And whatever is the best site for it to fall out is where it's gonna fall out. It doesn't have to be one single thing. It doesn't have to be a recipe that's exactly the same as the last deposit. It's a process model rather than a sort of ingredient model. And, and that sort of observation um, was, I guess, put into a, a paper in an Oz IMM annual conference. I'm sure there are people who did this beforehand, but the one that's always quoted is by Leslie Wyborn, who was one of my sort of early mentors. I seem to have got a, a lot older, but she doesn't seem to it for some reason. But um, the, in 94, looking at Australian protozoic mineral systems and mapping processes and thinking about how to take processes and map those rather than characteristics and map them. And that's led to a whole series of, of I guess, refinements and developments um, by the Center for Exploration Targeting in UWA, a number of other groups around the world. Um, the Geoscience Australia, Roger Skiro has done a lot of work uh, on this in, in, in a few different areas. Um, uh, Chris Lawley and, and company from the uh, from the Geological Survey of Canada, working on uh, intrusion hosted, well, a whole range different, but in this case, magnetic nickel, copper cobalt, PGE deposits. And, uh, and Geoscience Australia also did one of these for, 
for the entire continent as well. The reason I'm focusing in on that one is that those of you who didn't weren't aware that there were people actually spending significant amounts of hours working on stuff like this and might be thinking, what a colossal waste of time and perhaps um, something that's best suited for uh, for academic uh, for academic endeavors rather than anything else. And what I'm showing here on the right is a, a map from 2018 with a star on it. And that star is the Julemar discovery um, from 2020. And that discovery is a world-class nickel cobalt PGE deposit that was first highlighted by that regional um, by that regional work by Geoscience Australia. And, and David Houston, if you go to our GSQ UQ webinars, there's a there's a, a webinar by Dave Houston there where it actually shows the results of an economic analysis that was done. Um, placing a value on the work done in the Exploring for the Future program that Geoscience Australia led doing this sort of prospectivity mapping. And essentially, that discovery has paid for all prospectivity mapping in perpetuity until the end of time, uh, because it's not very expensive to do. And, and it, you know, the problem is you have to do it well. If you do it badly, you're never going to find anything. But, but of course, we did it well. Um, so how do you break that down? What I'm showing here is a sort of a four-dimensional map. You think, oh, God, here we go. I need you on this. Um, so what we're looking at here is four tracks. Drivers. So what's, what's you know, the, basically hydrothermal ore deposits formed by, by moving around in the crust, picking up metals, being driven to spots where they, where they concentrate along pathways. And we're calling them tracks here, but they're really chemical or uh, physical gradients that cause minerals to pre precipitate. And they don't do it steadily as a sort of drip, drip, drip process. They do it in response to, in response to particular things that happen at particular times. So in the case of Mount Isa, for example, Australia or the fragment of Australia that Mount Isa was sitting in um, was happily drifting along. And then when you look at the apparent polar wandering path, it did a bumper car. Basically, it moves along and then slammed into something and changed direction. When it slammed into that something, that reverberated through the basin, changed the flow of fluids, and caused the formation of the Mount Isaac deposit. So it's those sorts of time, those sorts of individual points in time that we have to take into account as, as well. So I'm going to show you an example of that. And that sort of put Dr. Strange's love there. So this is really a journey into the deranged mind of targeting geologists, but what I'm showing here is all, all these different S's and D's and P's and T's are sources, drivers, um, pathways and tracks. So if we look at Ernest Henry, this is really a diagram talking about Ernest Henry. If we go to the bottom here, we're looking at the whole crust in the asthenosphere. So the crust and lithospheric mantle overlying the asthenosphere. What we see is that these deposits coincide with ancient crustal boundaries. They don't just form anywhere. And they also form often in areas, and this has been shown quite well recently, in areas where that the this um, boundary, the lithosphere boundary, changes in depth. Um, so so that, that's an important pathway. Um, and then in terms of drivers, um, we have a, a what we're calling a mafic underplate here, which is a, a basically a, an intrusion that makes it into the base of the crust. Um, and if we go up into this diagram, which is just focusing in a little bit more, in terms of the source of the fluid, we have a, a metamorphic or basin fluid that's circulating through the rocks, driven by this, this um, uh, granite intrusive. And there's an enormous voluminous granite intrusive um, um, episode at the time of the formation of Ernest Henry and a lot of the other deposits and it's driving fluid circulation. And it's circulating through mafic rocks, basalts or gabbros, and it's also cir circulating through felsic tanks, stripping uranium, rare earths, copper and iron, moving through fractures, producing big zones of magnetite alteration. Um, and as they get shallower and shallower, they're, they're dropping out mineralization in areas of chemical contrast. So it's a redox contrast, oxidized fluid interacting with a, a reduced host rock as well as competency contrast, where, where you're suddenly 
um, getting uh, uh, fluid focusing associated with uh, permeability patterns relating to the competency contrast of the rocks. So the game that we go into is to take that sort of crazed um, conceptual model and turn it into something mappable. And we do that using data. So we've got mineral occurrences, we've got rock lithogeochemistry, so rock analyses, we've got stream sediment geochemistry, there's a there's a, this is just showing drainage basins for Queensland. Um, we've got geophysical data sets. We can invert those geophysical data sets to, to density and to magnetic susceptibility to make them closer to rocks. And then we've got some other you know, deep crustal geophysical data sets that tell us about that, that deep part of the crust that, that guides um, fluid flow. So you know, I won't won't spend too much time on this, but you know, for the IOCG model, for example, we're, we're looking on the right here of taking those those data sets and saying, well, these are these are all the rock units in Queensland that have greater than 90th percentile total rare earth elements um, in the data set. So they're rare earth enriched. And if we've got fluids that are circulating that are stripping and concentrating rare earths, then that would be a good place to start to look for them. And then we take the drainage geochemistry, which is more of an indication of, of where um, where potential deposits were, but also potential source rocks. And what we're looking at here is rare earths, light rare earths, and heavy rare earths. And this is just a, a really simple, um, you know, uh, the minimum rare earth value is, is a simple fuzzy end query, you know, so it's basically saying if this, this um, you know, this red, this red one, this red drainage basin here in Cape York is, uh, it's basically saying it's above the 90th. There's three three standard deviations above the mean in every single heavy rare earth um, element. And uh, whereas down here, what we're seeing is for the maximum, we're seeing that one of the heavy rare earth elements is uh, is is three standard deviations above the mean. So so we're using those those sorts of simple manipulations of geochemistry. And I guess what you can see from this, without spending too much time on it, is that. Um, the Cape York area is very uh, perspective for, for rare earths. And we're doing a series of lithological extractions rather than looking at the age of the rocks. We're saying, well, are they reduced? Are they oxidized? Are they competent or are they, are they um, incompetent? In other words, you know, are they more ductile than, than brittle? And I, I expect you to read all this. I don't, don't expect you to read any of it. This is sort of the the broader range of thinking for a whole range of different, um, uh, I guess, models for rare earth deposits because there's more than one. So what we what we end up with, and I'll show you this on, on the online tool in a second, is this uh, is this situation where you know for iron oxide copper gold deposits like Ernest Henry, we've got drivers where we mapped a series of different characteristics spatially that we think are representative of of drivers of fluid flow and pathways, and that relates mainly to faults and deeper geophysical structures, um, sources which relate to rock types or uh, other, other data that, that allow us to map potential sources for rare earths, and then depositional gradients that are causing rare earths to drop out. And it's part of those are, are detection related, the, the geochemistry, but then other ones are related to an interpretation of things like here, we've got redox boundaries and, uh, um, you know, uh, I guess favorable, favorable chemical hosts um, for other reasons um, and so on. So if we come back, I'm not going to talk about this diagram again. So what we end up with then is maps that, that use three coefficients. So it's your confidence um, and the, uh, it, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the confidence, applicability, and uh, oh god, I forgot what the third one is. <laughs> I'll show you in a second. Uh, there are three different coefficients you use to say: Is this data? Do I believe this data set? Is it really applicable? Um, can we use it, or um, or um, should we place less emphasis on it because I'm not sure it actually works? Um, and and so we've gone for these four different characteristics here, and then combined them into a into a single prospectivity map that results in a, a series of kind of areas of, areas of interest that I'm showing over here. 
So that's an example of the sort of thing that we do. And, and we've done the same thing for um, what we're calling metasomatic uranium rares, things like Mary Kathleen and, and Valhalla. Um, and I'm, I'm just really showing you these to, to show you that we've done a lot of them. <laughs> I don't know if you go through them all. Uh, phosphorites are another big potential source. That's a little bit different, that one, because it actually requires a, a younger weathering step. So we've got the Georgina Basin, um, a source region that is adding rare earths to the ocean, and then upwelling areas that we have to try to detect with geophysical data sets or, or with geoscientific data sets, and then a, a gauging of where um, where secondary weathering has take, taken place to allow concentration of rare earths because that's that's where you see um, better grades of, of rare earths in, in actually in a lot of rare earth deposits. In Mount Weld, for example, um, which is Australia's richest rare earth deposit, wouldn't be a deposit if it weren't for the um, secondary enrichment. So one thing, one of the things that we wanted to do was to, um, rather than just placing our own judgment on all these criteria, was to actually say, well, um, we want the user to be able to change what they think is important. If they, you know, if they look and say, well, you use this data set, but I completely disagree with it. I don't want to use it, but I don't want to go back and do your whole exercise again. So we actually um, developed a tool and it's still, it's, it's way, it's very far from perfect. Um, I sort of did the, the basic part of it, um, and then the rest was way below my, beyond my IT skills, but my son just finished an IT degree, so he did it. <laughs> so he set up actually, I, I've done the website, I'm okay on websites, um, but he set up a JavaScript tool that will actually take, um, in this case, about a 20, a 20 layer, um, basically a, a 20 layer um, it set of information relating to the various different criteria I was talking about, and then allow you to go over here and change the coefficients for the source, for the driver, for the path, for the trap. Um, and then if you're looking at source, you can then say, okay, well, what is S1? And you click on that, it says, okay, that's non-magnetic sources of iron, copper, et cetera. Um, and this one is um, association of rare earth deposits with alkaline igneous rocks that are that are mapped regionally and so on you say well um, I don't actually believe that this one's important so you can change its importance applicability or confidence to whatever sort of value you want or if you say well I'm actually only interested in in the um, in I, I'm not interested in the traps I can run that to zero and then uh, and then run that again and you'll get a different result might not look different, but it is different, believe me. So I'll, I'll, turn, I'll turn another one off and you'll see that it's... So you can see those are, those are changing. It's pretty rudimentary, but at the same time, I couldn't find anyone who knew how to do it. Um, so, uh, so we'll go back to this one, and I'll, I'll show you another example of that. So if we don't want to play with the source, we want, actually want to play with the drivers. See these big things that look like big areas of cello tape? Um, those are actually interpreted mantle plume tracks, um, which are important for alkaline uh, deposits or arguably important for them. People have published saying that they think they're important. Um, but you know, someone might say, well, actually, I don't think they're I don't think they're important at all. So we can take their importance down to zero and uh, run that again. Oops, I've got the wrong one. Now the plume tracks are gone. So what this allows you to do is basically use whatever criteria you think are, are important. And this all looks pretty low resolution. You can do it in high resolution as well, but it's all running on JavaScript off of something that's sitting on the Amazon web server. It's a, it's a 500 megabyte file. So, so if you run it if you run the full resolution one, it takes a little bit longer. So we've got a low resolution one for you to play with it, and then you can run a high resolution one. And so I don't have one that I made earlier, but there's enough time here for me to do a slight, a, a, a short, um, a short announcement for our sponsors while we're waiting for that to finish. Um, and the Geological Survey of Queensland was the was the supporter of this project, 
as I said, my son did the did the online thing. Um, it was a great fun working with him, and uh, and it was based on open source code called GeoRaster from then before. So, um, and you can see now that when you that they the, there's a better the, there's a better resolution version of, of that now that you can continue to play with if you want. But oops, zoom back too far. And we've done this for. Um, if you go back to the, uh, if you go back to the website, oh, it's, it's probably, we've got 10 up there now. There's six more that have just been finished, so they'll go up. By the time we finish, we'll have about 25 different models probably that are available to, 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 uh, to access for anyone to, to, to play with. Okay, so I'm going to come back to the presentation now. The other thing I want to talk about, though, is that there's another approach that has actually been probably more successful than all the approaches that I've talked about so far to exploration, and that is to go out and look at old mineral occurrences. Um, Doug Brewster, who I used to, who you know, I still keep in touch with from time to time, has done analysis of this. And you would think in a mineral place like Queensland that that any sort of significant mineral occurrence would have a would have a you know that, that was of interest would have a drill hole next to it. But what he worked out was that about five percent of the mineral occurrences in Queensland that could potentially be significant have have drill holes next to them. I can't remember if it was five or seven, but it was a scarily small number. Um, but when you actually go to the mineral occurrence data set and go, tell me where all the rare earth occurrences are, um, there's only 15 of them. And that doesn't mean there are 15 mineral occurrences. What it means is that um, Joe Prospector doesn't know what rare earth, he doesn't know what dysprosium looks like, or doesn't know what, to, sorry, uh, you know, doesn't know what a, 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 you know, a rare earth mineral looks like. So um, um, they've missed a lot. So what we actually did was took the uh, associated, took the, there's a USGS data set of world rare earth occurrences um, and associated minerals. And so we then did a, did a, uh, developed a, you know, an assemblage of minerals that was most commonly associated with global rare earth occurrences and applied that, that assemblage back to the, back to the mineral occurrences in Queensland. And, and that took us up to about 1,600, nearly 1,700 um, mineral occurrences that have similar mineralogy, even though they don't have any recorded rare earth elements. Um, and then um, we took all these prospectivity maps that we generated and said, well, of all these mineral occurrences that look like they could potentially be rare earth occurrences, which ones of them have high rare earth prospectivity based on our regional analyses. And what came out of that basically is that nearly 600 of them were, were deposits that, that had the same mineralogy as world rare earth occurrences um, and were highly prospective in our regional analyses, um, but just didn't have any recorded rare earths associated with them. So if you didn't want to go through all that the academic line of thinking, you could say, well, all these spots have potential for rare earths. I'm going to go have a look at them and see if they've got any rare earths in them. I'm going to take some samples and just and, and, and analyze for them. Because the other thing that I guess is reflective of the, the extent to which we're behind in, in rare earth and, and other new economy mineral exploration is that we have very few analyses for, for those elements in our regional data sets. It's almost all of our analyses are copper and gold and lead and zinc and, and silver and, and so on. So, so there are very few um, analyses. I mean, they're getting more and more now, but a multi-multi-element with low detection limits. So, and this is just a map taking all the different, this, the other thing you can do is say, well, I don't care what the model is. I'm gonna combine all the models and then say, well, what, which areas are perspective for everything? You know, it doesn't matter what you, which model you use, it comes out as perspective. Um, and, and that's what the image shows on the, on the left. But basically what came out of this is that, um, you know, for different 
deposit types, we came up with a whole series. In addition to those nearly 600 spot locations that are worth following up, we came up with a whole series of new areas that had that that have not been really systematically explored for um, for these various different types. In this case, of rare earth elements, but we've done the same thing for cobalt, for moly and rhenium, for silica. Um, and uh, and are continuing on with you know tin tungsten with a range of other uh, range of other elements. So um, and this is where Geoscience Australia's work was in 2018, and two or three years later, um, one of these areas actually produced the world class discovery. So I'm not taking credit for one ahead of time because you know the, the chances are there won't be one, but they certainly have highlighted areas that are that have a a justification for being followed up. So that's, I guess, an example of some of the work that we're doing um, in that case relating to the finding part of, of, uh, of the critical minerals area. But what we're also seeing and what we're working very hard on is that there are a whole series of, of opportunities to carry out useful and meaningful research in this area right now to accomplish some of these um, Goals set in the in, in the vision down below. Um, the we're uh, one of the most significant ones is that um, over the over the Christmas break um, there was the announcement of a trailblazer scheme by the federal government. I won't spend too much time talking about that, but um, one of the one of the projects that got through the first round of of cuts in that was a joint project between Curtin, ourselves, and James Cook University, looking at critical minerals. That includes, um, uh, you know, a fair amount of these the, the things that I've talked about today. But there are also a number of other opportunities at, at state and federal level, as well with as well as with a growing list of companies who are focusing on these on these commodities. So so it's a growing area for us. We were doing nothing in it three years ago. So so it's something where we I think we developed a, a sort of really exciting um, group of projects that were trying to take forward as, as, um, as best we can. That's about it, I think. So thanks very much for your attention. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yeah, also, anybody who's online, um, feel free to type a question into the into the Q and A or the. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, thanks, Rick. I was a as a non geologist, a really fascinating insight to what goes on. Um, a quick comment and then a question. The comment is I was greatly taken by your warning that it's very uh, dangerous to simply look for the same formula all the time. Um, when I was in the diamond business, uh, that was the mistake the beers made. They got really good at finding conventional fibrolite deposits in southern Africa. And they developed a technique which worked almost all the time, which did not work for Argar, which turned out to be the end of the deposit that you could find by actually looking for diamonds rather than indicated minerals. And, and CRA, that didn't know how to look for diamonds, found it. Yeah. Uh, but largely by accident. So the question is. Um, what happens next when you've got these fantastic tools in place, which is obviously an aid to the people who then want to look at the deposit and perhaps exploit it? Is there a, an obvious path for a junior or a major, for that matter, to come and take the tools and start drilling and, and doing what you have to do to develop the project? That's that's part of the reason that we made all you know the. When, when a lot of these projects got set up with the Geological Survey of Queensland, use that was an, one as an example. Um, we actually had a long look at the history of projects that had been supported in this area, trying to bring, I guess, academic knowledge to, to the business of exploration. And there were so many fantastic things that were done, but I think what we felt was that there was not enough emphasis placed on putting the information into a form that people could use and apply to their exploration, which is why, you know, we did a lot of things like the, um, the atlases um, 
that you know we have we have these atlases that we just basically give to people where where they're not you know they're not the they're not the highest level of science I guess you would say but what they are is a a knowledge of of what the characteristics are of different deposits in a way that it delivered in a way that people can use right away they don't have to read a paper and say you know by this method if you understood all this and had a spare couple of months you could turn this into something that you or your children or your children's children could apply to exploration it's much more like here it is i've spoon fed, spoon fed this to you or tried to spoon feed this to you so you can do your job and rather than trying to convert my work into something you can apply and that's why with the with the compilation, for example, the, you know, as soon as we finish them, they, they go online, all of the data sets are there for people to use in their own GISs, but they can also go, just go straight onto the, on that online tool and, and do what they like with it. Um, and really, um, you know, when you look at the other projects, they're all sort of trying to follow that principle of getting, getting meaningful data into people's hands in a form that doesn't require them to do a whole lot of work. Or they can use it. We've got one from from Ariane Ford online. Thanks, Rick. Great talk. As an example, you have an IOCG mineral potential map that potentially has cobalt associated with it. How does the model differentiate between the IOCG systems that are cobalt rich and those that aren't? Is it the inclu inclusion of a cobalt geochemical anomaly map? That's a that's a really really good question, Ariane, and welcome back to Australia as well after you stint in in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, it's a um, it's a very good question, and I think the, the we found this with rare earths as well because we've got a, a cobalt um, a cobalt focused IOCG map. We've got a, a rare earth focused IOCG map, and and I guess it it is around. You know some of the differentiators there are going to be some similarities in the model um you know particularly pathways and drivers and that sort of thing but i guess the differentiator is to say okay well, where are the areas that that um, potentially have more cobalt or more rare earths as a source rock number one and number two yeah where are the the you know detection re related geochemical data sets that give you encouragement that the cobalt is there Great talk, Rick, thanks a lot. Um, I guess my question is about so two aspects. And the pyramids on that sort of open the data. So one question is uh, there's a lot of data obviously out there which is corporate and they're not going to make it public. If you had that data, how much better do you think things would be? Is, I guess, my one question. And then my other is also related to, you know, we show that map and there were three or four you know, rare earths on it. That reminded me of, you know, we used to try and convince people when they're out there doing, you know, sampling or gathering data to go that extra mile and gather extra data, which they don't need right now, but if you get it at the same time, it's, you know, not a lot more effort, but the results are greater. So from that side, what other information should we actually be targeting for maybe the next round? You know, should we be looking for the next round of even critical metals, which you know in maybe 40, 50 years' time we're going to be going on these things? Should we be looking for those now, even though we don't need them right now? I guess is the question. One of the things that's that's also been part of this new economy minerals initiative that's that's being led by the by the Geological Survey of Queensland. That they've been doing is actually going back to um, old deposits and uh, and resampling them with lower detection limits and with uh, you know 65 elements with appropriate um, you know analyses with appropriate analysis techniques um, to try to you know to try to actually get the maximum amount of value from samples that are there and available um, and I think. Um, that's an important thing to do. I mean, in terms of saying to a company, oh, why did you go out there and, and only take this many samples or only drill this many holes? A lot of those companies have, you know, they're spending their their last 
fifty thousand dollars on that last drill hole in, in, in hopes that they were going to you know get some good results um, and be able to raise more money and keep going so you can't say to them oh it wasn't very scientifically rigorous uh, what you did so but but yes i mean i think we there, there has been a program to try to provide guidelines to groups about about how to uh, you know about what we would like to see being analyzed for and a lot more groups are now doing a much broader suite of elements to so that you're not thinking about what's play for the month today that it could be something that as you say could be um you know important 20 years from now um so it's uh there was another thing i was going to answer but i've forgotten that so so i'll we'll have to leave that answer there <laughs> Um, Rick, yeah. uh, I have a question because we see that currently there are many companies trying to use these big data sets uh, in studies using deep learning and stuff like that. But generally, the studies are generated by computer scientists without the input from geologists. But in this case, we see that, that we have all these layers uh, where we put our, our knowledge as a geologist. So, how do you think we could try to? Try both approaches together and see if in how, how they they we can get info, information from them. Uh, because in the case of rare air, as as we said, there are many things that we don't know. So maybe in those layers we are not putting that information that we don't know, and maybe we can get from yeah, just uh, algorithms from yeah, that's like that. It's a uh, you know it's a very good point. I guess. We deliberately took a low tech approach. Um, I think there's there's a lot of, you know, I think there's a lot of value in machine learning in a whole bunch of different areas. But one thing it won't do is create data where there isn't any. It just won't do it. <laughs> or if it does, I wouldn't believe it <laughs> because it will create a, a pattern based on the patterns it's seen elsewhere that may or may not be right. But I don't. It may not be helpful in that case. But that doesn't mean that there's no value to it because there's a huge amount of value but the approach i guess that we took was much more and it, and and i should say and i think i already said the one that i showed today was stolen from geoscience australia it's one that they published in a lot of detail in their regional lead zinc targeting exercise that resulted in a you know spectacular success and the thing i like about it is as a geologist i can think about importance applicability and confidence i can't think about um you know how the how the the cnn was set up to to uh, come up with an answer and then interrogate that answer um but i think that that certainly doesn't mean that there's no place for it and i think there are a lot of groups you know one of the things that that i've been saying for a while was you know give me a call when when the first discovery is made on the basis of regional machine learning um, targeting and I think that's happened now in a few few different places. So it, it's definitely something that's applicable, but I, I I don't think it's the I don't think it's what's holding us back in this sort of setting. I think what's holding us back is is areas for which there are little data. I think that's the value as we said, right? We can change the criteria according to what we want to see. Yeah. Matter learning you just Put your data get something and probably yeah. sometimes you don't know what, what, what you're using. And I mean, you can also play games like with, I uh, didn't really talk about it, but in some, you know, obviously in, in Queensland, there are two, um, you know, they're from a point of view of hard rock mineral targeting, there are two settings. There's the setting where the rocks are exposed and the setting where the rocks are buried. And where the rocks are exposed, there are 50 data sets. And where the rocks are buried, there are three. Um, and so it's it's um, you have to apply different criteria. And if you're applying a criteria where you're saying where you're applying criteria based on 50 data sets, but you've only got three data three data points in the covered areas, then you're they're always going to come back as low prospectivity. So so in some of the exercises that were more focused on, um, I, I guess that, that had larger amounts of data we develop different criteria for buried and, and exposed areas. So I've got another one here online. 
as a geologist, mineralogist, is there any data gap or missing either because of detection limits or resolution that you could believe could be the next piece of work for neurological characterization from kilometer to, to nanometer? Um, okay, let me think about that one. Is there data? I mean, yes, <laughs> there are lots of them. Um, the, I think the biggest data gap, particularly for new economy minerals, is just the lack of, you know, the lack of analyses. Um, we have systematic regional geochemical data sets, but um, there are some, you know, whole suites of rock units for which we really don't have a reliable knowledge of what the, of what their signature is in these different elements that might tell us whether they're credible source rocks or not. Um, and uh, there are at when when you get to when you get to um, deposit scale, um, some of the work that that has been carried out as part of the program in the Mount Isa region over the last four or five years has developed a much better idea. And some of this was led by by University of Tasmania, and some of it led by James Cook, and we were involved in that as well. And and of course the GSQ. Um, you could you can actually see cryptic patterns in in mineral chemistry that aren't that aren't evident in in lithogeochemistry that could help to tell you whether you're in a halo or not. But it's probably not something that you're going to be able to apply at, at the sort of state level, which is what we were we were doing. Is that all the questions online? I think so. I don't see any. Oh, let me just check and make sure. I think there was a raise to hand earlier as well. Uh, not there anymore. There's nothing in the QA. Right. Yeah, the, the chat ones, I think there were lots of nice, lots of nice compliments. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Cam. Um, Patricio. Uh, but uh, yeah, no other, no other questions. So since geology does not end at geographical borders, <laughs> do we know of similar work done um, in other states? And yes, if yeah. it is, do you think we would see any surprises, for example, or something unexpected? Uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the studies, the, the same approach has been done actually before we did a lot of this work, um, Geoscience Australia and, and the NTGS and the Queensland survey did a work, did work on an area they called the Tiza area, Tenning Creek to Mount Isa. And, and that's been spectacularly successful um, in terms of taking what basically used to look like a bit of, you know, a bit of middle of nowhere with no prospectivity and pulling it apart into perspective areas where then the next CRC has gone in and drilled some very encouraging, not, not they didn't discover an ore body, but they didn't, it wasn't a duster either, if you know what I mean? They, they actually found what they were looking for, which is very encouraging for the first drill hole under, under sort of fairly deep cover. And it's the sort of approach that I think is gonna to have to be used. Um, but that was a good example of a sort of cross-border exercise. And, no doubt there'll be more of more of those. And of course, Geoscience Australia has done a whole series of the country level ones that have, have already been very, very successful. So fascinating. Thanks, Rick. Thanks uh, for a fascinating presentation. Um, please join us next week uh, when we have um, another fellow SMI colleague, Dr. Artem Golov from the Center of Mind Land Rehabilitation. And uh, he will be presenting on values, tailings, and sanitology. Great. Thank you.